Okay, if you came here from the Superman Batman Public Enemies video, then this is a follow-up to it. That video was about the first six issues of the started Superman Batman comic book series and the animated movie they were adapted into. With minimal effort and how the same motivation was kept in adapting issues 8 through 13 a year later in 2010. The storyline of those six issues was used as the reintroduction of Superman's cousin Supergirl, the Karazor L version, into the post crisis continuity after she was killed off during Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985. She was killed off back then because DC wanted Superman to live up to the Last Son of Krypton title without realizing that it meant that Superman was literally the last one to be born on Krypton before it blew up, not the last living Kryptonian. This six issues long story arc was written by Jeff Loeb, just like the previous one, but the artist's duties were passed on from Ed McGuinness to the now passed away Michael Turner, whose art style used to in this story was... interesting to say the least. You'll see why when we go over these six issues. You. I shouldn't need to give the story any setups, as it literally follows up from Superman Batman Public Enemies. But the necessary bit that I'm going to bring up is the kryptonite asteroid the size of Brazil that was on its way to hit Earth and was stopped by Captain Atom in the comic and by Batman in the animated movie. Following both outcomes, the asteroid broke into smaller pieces which then fell as smaller meteor rocks down all over the Earth. Which now then leads us to... Issue number 8. With all that kryptonite having fallen down to Earth, Superman has been quarantined into the Fortress of Solitude, while the Justice League, the Justice Society, Teen Titans and the Outsiders are working overtime collecting all that kryptonite. Batman is pulling his weight in collecting kryptonite from Gotham Bay, while Superman calls to ask if he can break his quarantine. Why Lois is not keeping him company as his spouse is beyond me. While Batman multitasks in collecting the kryptonite and ignoring Superman's isolation developed OCD, he comes across a submerged spaceship, of which passenger makes her way to the Batboat. Trying to get in, she activates the alarm and causes Batman to pursue as the Batboat crashes into the port. This passenger then wanders around Gotham while showing symptoms of the yellow sun radiation on Kryptonians, which for a first-timer can be hazardous for the observing audience. Ultimately, Batman manages to catch up with the passenger and use Kryptonite to knock her out. Following this, he takes the passenger to the Batcave for metahuman analysis test. The effects of the Kryptonite wear off and the passenger almost attacks Batman while ranting in her native language. But this time, Batman decided to let Superman out of his quarantine and accompany him as extra muscle. Superman being able to talk the same language as the passenger manages to communicate with her, calm her down, and so introduce her to Batman as his cousin, Kara Zor-El. Issue number 9. Sometime later, I assume by the time all the remaining Krypton has been cleaned up, Kara and her ship has been taken to the Fortress of Solitude. Thanks to Lois's off-screen help, Kara has also been brought some clothes to wear. This issue also expositions better how the poor girl is going through trauma of surviving Krypton's explosion by having her ship sink into the Krypton's debris and ending up in suspended animation for... 30 plus years, I guess. And having last seen Superman as Baby Cal L, with now seeing him as a grown man older than her with the knowledge of their world and culture dead and gone, this has to be a lot to process for the teenager. Kara's ship having sunken into the kryptonite debris also supports the theory that since her ship was always on the course to arrive to Earth, the large kryptonite asteroid was indeed always going to crash down to Earth as well. This makes Luthor's ramblings from public enemies clearer in blaming Superman for it. But if he learned about it from Darkseid, then Darkseid must know about Kara as well. Batman being Batman in the early 2000s, keeps suspecting Kara for not being who she says she is. And Superman having spent weeks in isolation where even his wife didn't keep him company, 
is overjoyed of having found a member of his family. So basically, we have two extremes with Kara in the middle. As her family member, Superman wants to let Kara walk around the world outside the fortress and overrules Batman's protest in not trusting a girl who can't even remember her mother's name. Then here in the middle, for some scene transitioning, we have a scene from Apocalypse where Granny Goodness is testing a new phone script if she is ready to join the female Furies. No, she is not. And following this failure, Darkseid issues the order for Granny Goodness and the female Furies to bring him the girl who fell to Earth. Okay, I didn't address Kara being nude in the issue 8 because it was handled somewhat tastefully with obscure points of view that didn't expose her sexually exploitative ways. But this is something I need to talk about more. It was previously mentioned earlier in this issue that Lois had bought Kara the clothes she is wearing. But looking at her figure, her mental age, and what she is wearing, it is rather clear that this issue was written and drawn by two men. So, when it comes to this next scene in Metropolis, where Kara is walking around with Superman as Clark Kent, if you didn't know that these two were cousins in relation, what would be your first assumption of seeing this 30 plus years old man walking along with a teenaged girl dressed like this? Comment your suggestions below, but I'm sure all of them would have been avoided if Lois was here to accompany them. That would have made Clark look like a married man connecting with his younger, long-lost family member, with his wife supporting him through the experience, instead of an older married man being a sugar daddy to a younger, underaged girl. And with Batman shadowing them, to some onlooker, he might look like a pimp keeping an eye on his... Okay, I have no words to describe it further, and I'm surprised how I have not come across any abridged versions of these panels online. Moving on, Clark and Kara walk into the Heroes Park to the Superman statue, where they are ambushed by Amazons, Artemis of Banna Migdal, and Lula the Harbinger. Clark switches to Superman, with Batman joining him in fighting them, during which Wonder Woman grabs Kara and announces that she is coming with her. Issue number 10. This issue starts weeks in quotations later in Themyscira, where Kara has been taken to train with the Amazons to learn better discipline over her powers, and with Wonder Woman granting Superman and Batman the privilege of being present. This was in 2004, and since Hippolyta is nowhere to be seen, I assume Wonder Woman had exceeded her mother as the new queen of the Amazons or something like that. Meaning that I don't know what the status quo was for her at this point. During a sparring session with Artemis, Superman overreacts when Kara loses a mock battle and pretty much causes a scene. Wonder Woman calls Superman out for his behavior and reminds him about why Kara was brought to Themyscira in the first place to which Superman keeps insisting that he can handle her as family. Kara reminds them not to talk about her like she isn't there, and tells Superman that in her opinion, it is in her right to choose if she stays on Themyscira training how to learn how to use her powers, not his. Wonder Woman sends Kara away with Lila, and Batman comments mentally about how this attitude can make Kara dangerous. In this conversation, it is revealed that Batman called Wonder Woman to come take Kara from Superman, which begs the question of why did Artemis attack Batman in the previous issue, and that it was meant as a wake-up call to how Superman has not been approaching Kara's arrival with common sense. Bringing Kara to Tamaskira was to keep her still hidden from the world, but also better prepare her to help her learn how to control her powers, rather than have Kara accidentally use her powers in public and be discovered. Kara overhears this conversation with her super hearing, and talks about what she heard with Lila, 
who can relate to the burden Kara has with her vision powers as the Harbinger. They talk in friendly terms as Kara decides to go for a swim before dinner, and after leaving, Lila gets a vision about her death. Back to the adults. Wonder Woman reveals to Superman and Batman that Lila has been having these kinds of destructive visions about Kara, and so far has been keeping her more experienced warriors ready. And that is when a boom tube opens with Doomsday falling through, followed by more Doomsdays, so Wonder Woman calls out her army and the battle begins, with Batman in the front lines with a battle axe. I am not an expert on warfare, ancient or modern, but wouldn't it have made more sense for him to act as a strategist and coordinate the Amazons? No way, this was in 2004 and Batman still had his plot armor. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman and the Amazons fight the swarm of doomsdays, eventually learning that they have no blood or any vital organs as they are defeated. This gains them the intel that the Doomsday clones are not alive, but rather animated things, so Superman has no problem one-shotting them all with his heat vision. Then after the battle, they find Lila dead on the other side of the island, with Batman having deduced that the Doomsdays were a distraction for another boom tube that opened there, and Lila's harbinger orb reveals that Kara was taken by Darkseid. Superman so swears to bring Kara back home. Issue number 11. An unknown amount of time later, Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman approach Big Barda, who used to live on Apocalypse and can get them there. This was before Cyborg got promoted into the Justice League and was upgraded to have Apocalypse technology among his augmentations, so he was not an option to go to yet. Whereas Barda has her training as a female Fury, and with Superman and Wonder Woman having their powers, Batman borrows the equipment used by Barda's husband, Mr. Miracle, without permission at first, so he can get around Apocalypse a little more believably. As Barda was taking a shower before they arrived too early, she goes to change into her Apocalypse war armor, and gives the Trinity a few panels to show how emotionally compromised Superman is in prioritizing Kara's safety over the Amazon warriors who died against the Doomsday clones. Batman, on the other hand, is written like he knows he is going to home at the end of the day. When they reach Apocalypse, they just up and decide to split up with Superman flying one way, Batman flying another way with Mr. Miracle stuff, and with Wonder Woman following Barda to the Colosseum to fight the female Furies who overpower them. On his end, Batman has to evade the demon dogs until he makes it to the armory to do stuff that will be explained in the next issue, and then the demon dogs ambush Batman there, following him whole. And this issue ends with Superman reaching Darkseid's palace, where he finds Kara standing next to Darkseid, and probably brainwashed into being his servant. Issue number 12. As the mind-controlled Kara begins to fight Superman as per Darkseid's command, Wonder Woman throws her lasso around Granny Goodness's neck to use her as a bargaining chip to get herself and Big Barda a victory over the female Furies. And Batman is surviving like he usually did back in 2004. So, while Superman is forced to fight Kara with Batman's borrowed kryptonite ring, Batman enters to confront Darkseid in a scene that people have glorified as an example of how overpowered Batman can be. So in the previous issue, Batman used Mr. Miracle's stuff to hack into Darkseid's armory and set off every Hellspore explosive ready to blow up in a suicidal game of chicken. Since the arming ghost for the Hellspore explosives is now changed, Darkseid cannot have them disarmed without Batman, who is the only one who knows the new codes. So after beating Batman for a show long enough, Darkseid yields commending Batman for his ruthlessness, or suicidal tendencies if you ask me. Then he somehow breaks his control over Kara, promises not to come for her again, and asks them to leave once the Hellspore explosives have been disarmed. Kara wakes up in Themyscira with Superman, Wonder Woman and Batman with just his left hand in a sling by her side. 
She pays her respects to Lila's gravesite before thanking Wonder Woman for the training and lessons she gave him. In Batman's case, she tells him that she finally remembers her mother's name Allura. And then she leaves Temeskira with Superman. Later in the Fortress of Solitude, Kara is given her Supergirl costume that is said to have been done by Ma Kent, just like Superman's costume. It probably was, but what fashion was it based on? Because the crop top with long sleeves and exposed midriff with a mini skirt again makes it look like it was designed by two men. Anyway, Superman plans to go introduce Kara to his Earth parents, but arriving at the Kent farm, they are ambushed by Darkseid, who tells them, I gave my word I would not come for the girl. Your death, however, is long overdue, Superman. Darkseid then punches Superman back and fires his Omega Beams at him. But Kara jumps in between, and on contact with the Omega Sanction is reduced to ashes. Issue number 13. The final issue of the story arc opens with Darkseid leaving while giving the morning Superman an apathetic This is all your fault speech. That however aggravates Superman into tearing Darkseid away from the boom tube he was about to leave in. Rightfully angered, Superman begins to fight Darkseid in telling him that he stole whatever future Kara could have had, which Darkseid agrees on in waiting that her future could have been as a member of his honor guard and maybe one day leading it. Once Darkseid seemingly gets the upper hand to fire his Omega Beams at Superman again, Wonder Woman appears to reflect them back at him with her bracelets. Keeping the fight personal, Superman throws Wonder Woman away, as Batman is shown collecting Kara's ashes, and then Superman takes his fight against Darkseid up, up and away from the Kent farm all the way to space. As they get closer to the sun, Superman lists out all the things he had enjoyed in life growing up that Kara will never get to. Things that Darkseid knows nothing about as a power-hungry world-dominating despot, and that makes him weaker in not truly having something to fight for. Or if you ask me, it's Superman's current mental state and being this close to the yellow sun charging up his powers that makes him stronger than Darkseid. As Darkseid grows weaker with Superman's strength remaining the same, Superman grabs Darkseid's mother box and opens a boom tube to the source wall at the edge of the known universe and sticks him into it. Trapped with so many others who have tried to breach it as a punishment and fate worse than death. Returning back to the Kent farm on Earth, Superman finds the Justice League present there fixing his parents' home and the barn that got damaged during Darkseid's ambush. The Flash tells him that the Kents are safe and that Green Lantern is picking up a new tractor for them, while Batman gives Superman all of Kara's ashes that he was able to collect from the ground. Or did he? Because next comes a rather odd plot twist in revealing that Kara was never actually atomized or got hit with the Omega Sanction, as she is revealed to be alive and okay in Themyscira. Her death had been a planned ruse in making Darkseid believe she was dead, so he wouldn't come for her again, and her death was faked out by having her be teleported from the Kent farm to Themyscira with the Justice League teleporter. And this was supposedly meant to be a plan that Superman himself came up. He didn't trust Darkseid to keep his word, so he decided to have Kara fly across the country as a literal red cape to the Voodoo attack. Wonder Woman's sudden appearance is explained with her having observed them and being the one to use the Justice League teleporter to teleport Kara to safety when the Omega Sanction hit her. Meaning that she was in the position to intervene when Darkseid briefly got the upper hand. And when Darkseid would have been overconfident in having successfully killed Kara, Superman would have been in the right mindset to battle Darkseid, who would now be caught off guard. Again, Superman's plan. What is even the point of having Batman be here? Regardless, this now provided Kara a choice to make on her own. She could A go back into hiding to live on Temeskira with the Amazons, 
beep. Live as a not so normal teenager in the world as a civilian, or C. We all know she picked the choice to begin her life as Supergirl. The story and the issue ends in the aftermath of Kara's decision to become Supergirl, and being introduced to the four major superhero teams in the DC universe at the time of the publication, which were the Justice League, the Justice Society of America, the Teen Titans, and the Outsiders. As Kara thanks them for accepting her into their community, the story also ends with a dedication to Christopher Reeve, who passed away around the time of the publication. Okay, as a modern retelling of Supergirl's arrival to Earth, this was not bad. Kara's disorientation of her new surroundings after having been on stasis for decades felt genuine, her fear of the unknown world she had woken up into was convincing, and the way how the story was about her finding a way how to integrate herself to Earth's culture was done well with the needed ups and downs. The soft cover trade paperback I have also came with the Kryptonian alphabet as the story also introduced the element of that aspect from the Kryptonian culture to establish that they were not human looking aliens who just happened to speak English. This is how Kara's monologue after arriving in Gotham kept her using those alien symbols to make her speech come across as gibberish. But using the alphabet helped deepen her characterization to how she was feeling on the subsequent reads. This is what made her feel more like an actual person having a life experience that led to Kara having to make the decision to become Supergirl on her own, with an added third option she could have taken in this will she won't she scenario. From a certain point of view, this was also a good thing for Superman to give Kara this choice in looking back to how he had been in the beginning of the story. Having been quarantined from the rest of the world due to the kryptonite fragments here and there, coupled with the overjoyed reaction of having discovered a blood-related family member, had not made Superman think straight as both Batman and Wonder Woman had observed. And then there was the fact that he had behaved like an overprotective parent or sibling towards Kara. This story is in issue 9 compared to a kind of love story not told much anymore about a family that grows to love each other by Superman, and by the end both he and Kara are able to come to terms with each other in how her arrival on Earth has affected them both going forward. With Kara taking her place as the modern version of Supergirl, and with Superman letting her operate as her own person without acting like an overprotective parental figure. There are some negatives to it, such as the cliffhangers of issues 9 and 12, which are revealed in the following issues to be explained away as having been fake-outs, but those were pretty much a stable for comic book writing back in the early 2000s. Comparing this to the following Supergirl origin stories that came out later, like in the New 52, which was mostly another example of the Agile method writing, with the Supergirl TV show that skipped over Kara's integration to Earth culture completely, and with Injustice 2, which I still plan to cover in the future. This storyline still holds rather well, with Michael Turner's art being mostly the deciding factor of how well it has aged. Mostly because of how Kara is drawn in issue 9, and with what she is wearing along with the out-of-context situations. Batman and Wonder Woman's side character roles were also rather restricted, especially with Batman mostly just hanging out in the background after having discovered Kara's ship, whereas Wonder Woman being more active in taking Kara in for training made her feel more like a main character than Batman did. And Darkseid as the antagonist felt kind of thrown in, with Jeff Loeb doing it mostly as a setup for more stories to be told later in the series, like with the following Absolute Power, Vengeance, and Torment, that latter being written by Alan Burnett. Okay, and now let's talk about the animated movie. This animated movie was directed by Lauren Montgomery and written by Tad Murphy, with a longer runtime than the Public Enemies movie by being 78 minutes long. Just like that animated movie, previous voice actors from the DC animated universe came back, with Tim Daly as Superman. Her name is Kara Zor-El from Krypton. 
She's my cousin. Kevin Conroy as Batman. Your cousin just torched $50,000 worth of custom hardware. Susan Eisenberg as Wonder Woman. Look around. What if this had been the middle of the day? The park crowded with people. And Ed Asner as Granny Goodness. Don't worry, baby girl. You won't be alone for long. The new voice cast for other important characters include Sumer Glau as Kara. I thought I knew what I wanted, but now I feel more lost than ever. And Andre Braugner as Darkseid. She's free to leave, if that is what she desires. The film's plot synopsis follows the comic pretty accurately, with some minor changes written to where the issues reach their cliffhangers. Some examples of this included Batman having a Sigma male kind of reaction to Superman introducing Kara as his cousin at the end of issue 8. Your cousin just torched $50,000 worth of custom hardware. Send me the bill. On a reporter's salary. Right. Wonder Woman and Batman explaining the ambush on Clark and Kara in Metropolis. Look around. What if this had been the middle of the day? The park crowded with people. Children. She needs more specialized training. I'm taking her with me with Artemis not attacking Batman this time in issue 9, and by having a scene of Kara being thrown into Darkseid's mercy by Granny Goodness after her capture in issue 10. The events of issues 11 and 12 are pretty much told organically from the beginning to near its end point, where the film did away with that fake out death Superman had planned for Kara. Instead of flying to the Kent farm in costume, Kara is brought there with Clark Kent on a truck ride, and Darkseid ambushes them in a caught off guard situation where getting hit by the Omega Sanction does nothing to Kara, and they might as well be beams of sunlight to her. And it even looks like Kara's heat vision is doing more damage to Darkseid than his Omega beams are doing to Kara. Okay, I can understand why this was probably done. This was mostly Kara's story to be told and following her experiences in training with the Amazons and surviving Darkseid's servitude on Apocalypse, it would have been a robbed opportunity to not show her using her powers against the final boss now that she had a proper control over them. The fight sequence, however, makes them rush through the time Kara was given in the comic to properly think through her options into pretty much immediately deciding to become Supergirl. And that is not all of it, because in the following scene, where the movie then ends and Kara is introduced as Supergirl, she is introduced to people who already know her, and not to any new people who would be good to be let know of her as well. We only see Batman, Wonder Woman, Big Bard and the Amazons that Kara trained with on Themyscira, and none of the other heroes from the Justice League, Justice Society, Teen Titans, or even the Outsiders there. Was it really not in the budget to have drawn 2D models of them be here, and learn of someone joining into their community? Was it? Outside of completely dropping the ball at the end here, Superman Batman Apocalypse, why was it called that, was about 80% done faithfully to the source material with minimal and justified fixes. I would not have a problem with the ending fight against Darkseid being drastically changed since it did lead to Kara eventually becoming Supergirl, but compared to the source material, this felt like a rushed heat of the moment decision instead of the final conclusion Kara decided to go with while also having two other options. And I already said how logistically lazy the final scene was without the other heroes of the DC Universe being present in Tamaskira to be introduced to Kara as Supergirl. So, the ending aside, this was a significant improvement to Public Enemies as an adaptation with the added runtime, but the ending felt poor when compared to the source material that the movie was meant to adapt. It did start out well and got through mostly the right way, but it missed the landing in reaching the end. And that is what made it an another watch once and then never bother to watch it again kind of film. Along with the Kryptonian language that the comic had in Kara's early dialogue, just ending up as random gibberish in the movie without any added subtitles to flesh it out in the spoken form. Bonan, Matenon. Monin Noctan? Salatan, Kalel Devahu. 
Je deneb et gay tegna. Pylon beer of the Ekuru. Kara Zorel set them on dead. Get abs of Kit again. That is pretty much all I have to say about the comic and its animated adaptation. Having gone over Supergirl's modern origin story now, I could probably go back into reviewing Injustice 2 for how she was introduced there as well, or do what that one guy asked me after my Batman video by doing some kind of review on the Supergirl TV show. If you watched this video this far, give me some likes to let me know how many of you got here, comment what you thought about the comic and the movie, or about what I could do next. Share the video for more people to see, and tap that subscribe button to be aware when more videos will be coming out. Also, ding the bell for a chance to chat with me on gameplay streams, and may your heart be your guiding key.